Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 35 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I'm the moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Andrew Basevich is Professor Emeritus of International Relations and History at Boston University. He's a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy and holds a Ph.D. in American Diplomatic History from Princeton. Before joining the faculty of Boston University, he taught at Johns Hopkins and West Point. In the 1990s, he retired from the U.S. Army with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel after serving in Vietnam, Germany, and the Persian Gulf. A prolific writer, he's the best-selling author of Washington Rules, an examination of the guiding assumptions that shape America's foreign policy and military strategy. The Limits of Power, a critique of America's broken government and overstretched military. And Breach of Trust, an exploration of the gap be between the reality that American soldiers face and the society that sends them to war. He has been applauded for reaching across political lines and speaking blunt truth to power. And the insights and expertise he brings to us today on America and the Middle East are both crucial and timely. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Andrew Basevich. Thank you. For well over 30 years now, the United States military has been intensively engaged in various quarters of the Islamic world. And an end to that involvement is nowhere in sight. Tick off the countries in that region that U.S. forces in recent decades have invaded, occupied, garrisoned, bombed, or raided, and where American soldiers have killed or been killed. Since 1980, they include Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, but also Iran, Lebanon, Libya, Turkey, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Bosnia, Kosovo, Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, Pakistan, and Syria. The list just keeps getting longer. What are we to make of the larger enterprise in which the United States has been engaged for, for well over three decades? What is the nature of the struggle we are waging? What should we call it? For several years after 9-11, Americans referred to it as a global war on terrorism, a misleading term that has since fallen out of favor. For a brief period during the early years of the George W. Bush administration, certain neoconservatives promoted the term World War IV. This never caught on, however in part because unlike other major conflicts, this one found the American people sitting on the sidelines. With the interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan dragging on inconclusively, some military officers in the middle of the last decade began referring to what they called the long war. And while nicely capturing the temporal dimension of the conflict, this label had nothing to say about purpose, adversary, or location. As with World War IV, the long war never gained traction. Here's another possibility. Since 1980, back when President Jimmy Carter promulgated the Carter Doctrine, the United States has been engaged in what we should rightfully call America's war for the greater Middle East. The premise underlying that war can be simply stated. With disorder, dysfunction, and disarray posing a growing threat to vital U.S. national security interests, the adroit application of hard power ought to enable the United States to check those tendencies and thereby foster conditions conducive to U.S. interests. Choose whatever term you like. Police, pacify, shape, control, dominate, transform. 
In 1980, President Carter launched the United States on a project aimed at nothing less than determining the fate and future of the peoples inhabiting the Ark of Nations from West Africa and the Maghreb all the way across the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf to Central Asia. Since the end of World War II, American soldiers had fought and died in Asia. And even when the wars in Korea and Vietnam ended, U.S. troop contingents continued to garrison that region. In Europe, a major U.S. military presence dating from the start of the Cold War signaled Washington's willingness to fight there as well. But prior to President Carter's watershed 1980 statement, no comparable U.S. commitment toward the Islamic world existed. And now that was going to change. Only in retrospect does this become clear, of course. At the time when President Carter declared the Persian Gulf, a vital national security interest, he did not intend to embark upon a war. Nor did President Carter anticipate what course that war was going to follow, its duration, costs, and consequences. Like the European statesman, who just over 100 years ago touched off the cataclysm that we know today as World War I, Carter merely let a fuse without knowing where it led. As an American, let me state plainly my own overall assessment of that war. We have not won it, we are not winning it, and simply pressing on is unlikely to produce more positive results next year or the year after. Questions raised by this undertaking will preoccupy and perhaps confound scholars for decades to come. In my remarks today, I'll limit myself to four of the most fundamental questions. First, what motivated the United States to act as it has? Second, what have the civilians responsible for formulating policy and the soldiers charged with implementing policy sought to accomplish? Third, regardless of their intentions, what actually ensued? And fourth, with what consequences? The United States embarked upon its war for the greater Middle East in order to preserve the American way of life. The United States embarked upon its war for the greater Middle East to ensure access to Persian Gulf oil. Both of those statements are true. Back in 1980, the American way of life required bountiful supplies of cheap oil, even today. Whether for good or for ill, that remains the case. Back in 1980, unlike today, the approaching depletion of once plentiful North American fossil fuel reserves appeared to be an irreversible fact of life. The implications of that apparent fact, driven home to the American people by the successive oil shocks of the 1970s, vaulted the Persian Gulf into the first tier of U.S. geopolitical interests. So just as the American Civil War was about slavery, America's war for the greater Middle East from the very outset has been about oil. Of course, slavery alone does not define all that divided North and South. At stake was not simply whether people of color should be held in bondage, but which political, economic, and social arrangements were to shape the American future. Similarly, even from the outset, Oil alone does not explain what drew the United States militarily into the greater Middle East. At stake were the expectations of limitlessness that many Americans take to be part of their birthright. During the 1960s and 1970s, the United States had seemingly run headlong into limits. In Vietnam, it encountered a war that it could not win at home. The golden age of post-war post -war prosperity sputtered to an end. Americans confronted low growth, high inflation, and industrial decline. The oil shocks of that decade were the icing on an unwelcome and unpalatable cake. The war for the greater Middle East was one expression of a collective determination to affirm the singularity of the United States as a nation not bound by the constraints 
that others were obliged to respect. In September of 2001, as the conflict was entering its third decade, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld took it upon himself to make explicit the rationale for war that until that moment had been largely implicit. We have a choice, Rumsfeld explained, either to change the way we live, which is unacceptable, or to change the way they live. And we chose the latter. We are exceptional and indispensable, so most Americans even today believe. And just as prior victories, most notably in 1865 and 1945, had established and affirmed that singular status, so too victory in the greater Middle East would preserve it. Now the resulting war divides into four phases, that is, four phases thus far. Phase one began in 1980 with the failed Iran hostage rescue mission known as Operation Eagle Claw and ended in 1991 with Operation Provide Comfort, the U.S.-led effort to assist the Iraqi Kurds after Operation Desert Storm. In the interim, that is between 1980 and 1991, an ill-conceived peacekeeping enterprise in Lebanon contrived by the Reagan administration had ended with the disastrous Beirut bombing of October 1983 and inconsequential jousting with Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi had culminated with the terrorist attack that destroyed Pan Am Flight 103, killing all on board. Meanwhile, during the first Gulf War of 1980 to 1988, the U.S. intervened both overtly and covertly on behalf of Saddam Hussein, even as the Reagan administration was secretly and illegally providing weapons to Iran. Go figure. In Afghanistan, meanwhile, covert U.S. support for jihadists attempting to oust Soviet occupiers ended up creating conditions leading to the rise of the Taliban, while encouraging radical Islamists like Osama bin Laden in the belief that superpowers could be had. When Saddam Hussein responded to the end of his war with Iran by invading neighboring Kuwait, George Herbert Walker Bush, assembled a massive coalition that restored Kuwaiti sovereignty in a campaign that seemed for a time to be a masterful victory. Appearances deceived, however. This second Gulf War left many loose ends. The principal legacy of that war was to loosen any remaining constraints in Washington's inclination to use its military power. U.S. intervention in the, in, the, in the greater Middle East was now becoming a matter of routine. By the time phase one ended, the U.S. had committed itself militarily to the greater Middle East on multiple occasions in multiple places. Yet neither Carter, nor Reagan, nor the elder Bush had devised anything remotely like a strategy to guide U.S. policy. In Washington, a coherent vision of what the United States was trying to do did not exist. Phase two of America's war for the greater Middle East began in 1992 when the elder Bush ordered U.S. forces to intervene in Somalia and ended a decade later in 2002 when Bush's son prematurely abandoned Afghanistan assuming that overthrowing the Taliban meant that the United States had finished with that country. In the interim, that is between 1992 and 2002, what had begun as a humanitarian intervention on behalf of starving Somalis morphed into an urban insurgency culminating in humiliating withdrawal when the notorious Black Hawk Down incident occurred and persuaded President Bill Clinton to cut his losses. 
Clinton did fare somewhat better in two successive Balkan interventions on behalf of besieged Muslim minorities, first in Bosnia and then in Kosovo. U.S.-led air campaigns, followed by U.S.-led occupations, enabled Bosnian Muslims and then Kosovars to achieve their political aims, but without improving Washington's standing in the broader Islamic world. Of greater significance than these Balkan interventions were the unintended consequences of the so-called dual containment policy inaugurated by the elder Bush and then sustained by Clinton, containing both Iraq and Iran in the 1990s required the permanent stationing of substantial U.S. military forces near the Persian Gulf, notably in Saudi Arabia. Low-level hostilities with Iraq continued throughout this decade. The second Iraq war continued, albeit with very few Americans taking notice. For his part, bin Laden took offense and declared war on the United States. Sporadic attacks on U.S. assets ensued in Saudi Arabia, Kenya, Tanzania, and Yemen. Clinton responded in desultory fashion with a few airstrikes. And the ineffectiveness of this preliminary campaign against al-Qaeda then became fully manifest in September 2001 with the devastating attacks in New York and Washington. George W. Bush, now president, responded by declaring a global war that began as less than a global war, but rather as an effort to punish the Afghans who had given sanctuary to al-Qaeda. The preliminary stages of what was called Operation Enduring Freedom were dramatic and daring, but inconclusive. But by the time phase two ended, the presence of U.S. forces in the greater Middle East, in addition to the likelihood of intervention in the greater Middle East, had now become routine. Now, however, for the first time since the inception of the war for the greater Middle East, Washington devised a strategy, which the Bush administration marketed under the label Freedom Agenda. The third Gulf War, begun in 2003 and lasting until 2011, was meant to jumpstart the process of transforming those countries that served as breeding grounds of anti-American violence. Here, the United States set out in Rumsfeld's words to change the way they live. This was the vision that animated U.S. actions during phase three of its war for the greater Middle East. Now, as a venue to begin implementing that strategy, uh, to, to change the way they live, Saddam Hussein's Iraq appeared uniquely attractive. True, Iraq had had nothing to do with 9-11, but Saddam had made his country an international pariah, virtually without allies or even sympathizers. The Iraqi army was not likely to pose significant opposition, having amply demonstrated its incompetence even before taking into account the effects of periodic U.S. bombing, along with a decade of crippling sanctions. In other words, what made it imperative to invade Iraq was not the danger that Iraq posed, but the opportunity that it presented. Yet although the invaders quickly got to Baghdad and overthrew the Saddam Hussein regime, they proved unable to assert control of that country. Instead, by their very presence, U.S. forces incited and then found themselves enveloped by a complex, multi-sided conflict that was part civil war, part ancient sectarian squabble, and part anti-Western jihad. 
We may argue about when to date the demise of the freedom agenda. Certainly, by late 2006, it had collapsed. Rather than a springboard, Iraq had become a dead end. And phase three of America's war for the greater Middle East thereby ended. Phase four commenced, but once more without any, any unifying sense of purpose. To effect the salvage operation, Bush hired a new field commander. This yielded the so-called surge, which created the conditions for the United States to withdraw from Iraq without having to acknowledge outright defeat. This it did. In December 2011, President Barack Obama keeping to a schedule that his predecessor had established. Turning his attention back to the much slighted war in Afghanistan, Obama then sought to apply the very methods that he had faulted Bush for employing in Iraq. Obama organized an Afghanistan surge, applying the same counterinsurgency techniques that had supposedly made the Iraq surge such a success. But the results proved to be a bit of a bust. In June of 2011, while announcing U.S. troop withdrawals from Afghanistan, President Obama said, we take comfort in knowing that the tide of war is receding. In fact, however, the tide was not receding. Even as Obama was struggling to extricate the United States from Iraq and Afghanistan, U.S. military activities in other quarters of the Islamic world were actually expanding. The Obama administration's chief contribution to the ongoing war for the greater Middle East was to enlarge it. Prior to 9-11, the abiding defect of U.S. military policy in the Islamic world had been naivete. After 9-11, it became hubris. During phase four, the problem was one of diffusion. Varying according to purpose, the Obama-era campaigns have fallen into three distinct categories. In some, the aim has been to depose. In others, to suppress in others still simply to retard. All share a common determination to minimize risks, keep down costs, and above all, avoid anything approximating a quagmire. Included in the first category, depose, was direct intervention in Libya and indirect intervention in Syria. The second category, suppress, included recurring military actions in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. The third category, retard, expanded America's war for the greater Middle East into West Africa, the Pentagon calculating that a modest U.S. military presence there could nip violent jihad in the bud. Regardless of intended purpose, however, little of this activity produced the desired effect. Yet overall, the number of active fronts in America's war for the greater Middle East multiplied. This has been President Obama's principal contribution to that war. Yet transcending the significance, transcending insignificance, the Obama administration's penchant for raids and assassinations was a fourth Gulf War dating from 2013, which rendered a definitive verdict on the third Gulf War. When tested, the new U.S.-created Iraqi order proved unable to stand on its own, its manifest shortcomings drawing the United States into yet another round of fighting. Further complicating the situation was the evolving circumstance in neighboring Syria. There, an ongoing civil war morphed into a multi-sided affair involving a new entity bent on carving out of Syria and Iraq the beginnings of a new pan-Islamic
caliphate. This new entity, variously referred to as ISIS, ISIL, or simply the Islamic State, aimed to demolish the state system created by early 20th century Europeans who had reconfigured the greater Middle East to suit their own imperial purposes. But by President Obama's second term in office, Americans had pretty much exhausted their enthusiasm for rescuing Iraq. Furthermore, it was not self-evident that ISIS posed an immediate danger to the United States itself. In December 2013, ISIS seized the Iraqi city of Fallujah and thereby emerged from Al-Qaeda's shadows. Early the following month, the organization's supreme leader declared the founding of a new caliphate and pronounced himself caliph. Worse was still to come. In June 2014, fewer than a thousand ISIS fighters captured Mosul, Iraq's second largest city, with the Iraqi defenders offering alarmingly little resistance. In Washington, something akin to panic set in. On August 7th, President Obama announced the beginning of a U.S. air campaign against the Islamic State, even as he assured Americans, quote, that I will not allow the United States to be dragged into fighting another war in Iraq. Now, in the American military lexicon, mission creep is a term of opprobrium, redolent with connotations similar to Vietnam's gradual escalation. It suggests action without clearly defined purpose. But when it comes to ISIS, the mission is unquestionably creeping. Here in the fall of 2015, no one can say with certainty how the fight against ISIS is going to turn out. But will defeating ISIS actually solve anything? Probably not, since the conditions that have given rise to ISIS would continue to persist. Yet more importantly, in my view, obsessing about this one specific manifestation of a much larger problem provides Washington and perhaps the rest of us an excuse to skip lightly past matters of far greater moment. In that regard, even in a presidential election year, one subject in particular remains off limits. The overall progress and prospects of the U.S. military project in the Islamic world. Thirty-five years after Jimmy Carter signed off on the Carter Doctrine, that project appears further from completion than when it had begun. By almost any measure, the region is less stable and more dangerous than it was in 1980. Not only are American purposes unfulfilled, they are becoming increasingly difficult to define with any sort of specificity. It's a generational problem. So remarked JCS Chairman General Martin Dempsey in testifying before a Senate committee in July of this year. Thwarting the adversary that we face, Dempsey continued, is going to entail, quote, a very long contest. How long? How much longer than it has already run? Wisely, General Dempsey did not hazard a guess. No one has a clue. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew Basevich. You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. 
Our speaker today is historian, military strategist, and foreign affairs expert, Dr. Andrew Basevich. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our media sponsor, the online news source, MinPost. Visit them at minpost.com for thoughtful analysis and commentary on Minnesota news. This is our last forum for 2015, but we'll be back on Thursday, February 4th in 2016, when Jim Wallace, the founder and editor of Sojourners Magazine, will speak on America's original sin, racism, white privilege, and the bridge to a new America. Look for information on the full spring season in early January on our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Dr. Basevich, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. It's interesting in your remarks, Dr. Basevich, you never mention one of the pressing issues, at least in the American view of the Middle East, Israel and Palestine. Uh, was there a reason you ignored that conflict in your remarks? <clears throat> no. <laughs> Has I, think it, I, think, I think it's important not to uh, overstate the uh, centrality of uh, Israel uh, in the narrative, in the historical episode that I just described. And I do believe that in certain quarters of uh, American opinion, there is a tendency to uh, overstate Israel, to see, to see Israel's existence as somehow the issue on which everything else in the region turns. I don't accept that. But... What I do believe is that it is time for Americans and for American political leaders to candidly acknowledge that in, in some very important respects, the interests of the United States in the Middle East do not align with the interests of Israel. Were I a Jewish citizen of Israel, I believe that I would oppose the two-state solution. Why? Because the risks to Israel of creating a genuinely sovereign Palestinian state are quite considerable. And indeed, I think that one could argue that from an Israeli perspective, the status quo is preferable to accepting those risks. But I'm not a Jewish Israeli. I'm a Catholic American. And as an American, it seems pretty clear to me that we have a profound interest in responding to the grievances of the Palestinian people. It goes, it includes, but goes beyond simply matters of justice. We should understand that the plight of the Palestinians is either a genuine rationale or an excuse for the anti-Americanism which is so prevalent in the Islamic world. And from an American perspective, therefore, responding to, that, to those claims is one way of either alleviating anti-Americanism if concerns about the Palestinians are genuine, or of exposing the hypocrisy of those in the Islamic world who oppose us and claim that the Palestinian cause provides a, 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 an adequate rationale. So it's time for us to say out loud that the peace process is, putting it bluntly, a fraud, it's time for us not simply to object to the continued uh, expansion of settlements on the West Bank, but to uh, act uh, in ways that will more clearly communicate that uh, those sorts of policies are unacceptable. What happened to the Arab Spring? Did that make any lasting difference in the region? No. <laughs> the 
certainly the eruption of the Arab Spring, Arab awakening, the uh, enthusiasm for political change, political reform, the calls for uh, democracy raised uh, uh, great expectations uh, in the West generally, in the United States, that uh, a wave of positive change was about to begin. Our hopes and expectations were naive. They were naive because the development of stable, legitimate, genuinely democratic political institutions uh, takes time. Uh, it, the, the process needs to be an organic one. It doesn't simply happen by the snap of the fingers. Certainly, in reflecting on the evolution of our own democratic institutions in this country, we ought to have some appreciation for that. The democracy, the republic, that was created as a consequence of the American Revolution had many grievous imperfections. And we have spent more than two centuries since collectively trying to recognize and correct those imperfections. Here we are, lo, these many years later, and guess what? We still have a ways to go. So um, the disappointment uh, that, that, that was produced by the Arab Spring ought not to be that much of a surprise. A number of questions coming from the audience about uh, your potential advice if you were asked by a president, or several asked if you were president. Uh, what would you do about the Middle East? What would your suggestion for strategy in the Middle East be in the future? The purpose of uh, the, the talk, and if I may insert a, a bit of self-promotion, the subject of a book I have coming out in April called America's War for the Greater Middle East, the purpose of the narrative is to suggest that the application of U.S. military power in whatever form is not going to solve the problem. Now, given, given the impoverished debate that we have with regard to foreign policy in our country, there will be those who say, ah, if you don't believe in U.S. military in intervention, you must therefore be an isolationist. You, you must therefore want simply to turn your back on the world and ignore these problems. That's not where I am. What I would suggest is that moving toward the demilitarization of U.S. foreign policy in the greater Middle East requires us to think creatively about how we should use our power and how we can, even if only marginally, bring our influence to bear in more productive ways than we have since 1980. What does that mean? Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me try to lay out uh, with at least some relative specificity what an alternative strategy might look like. Three parts. Part number one. Yes, there is a threat to the United States coming from the Islamic world. Yes, terrorism is a real thing. And the, and the appropriate response to that threat is to harden our defenses. You know, when we, when we recall the horrors of 9-11, and we ask ourselves, how could it be that 19 thugs armed with nothing more than box cutters could inflict that level of harm on our country? Certainly one answer has to be that we had failed to take minimally adequate measures to protect ourselves. Now, certainly here in 2015, we have improved that posture. But the threat is continuous. The threat of, continues to evolve. And therefore, keeping in place defenses that are effective requires a continuous effort. But that's priority number one. Keep the bad guys from getting to us. Not 
with any expectation that those defenses will be effective 100% of the time, any more than, than, than residents of the Twin Cities would expect that the police forces of Minneapolis and St. Paul 100% of the time will be able to prevent criminal activity in these two cities. But if effective policing keeps the threat of criminality at a tolerable level, and that's what defenses with regard to terrorism should also do. Second step, recognizing that our intervention, let's, let's focus specifically on the events that are going on right now in Iraq and in Syria, notably the rise of ISIS, recognizing that our military efforts tend to be counterproductive, are, we should find ways to encourage and empower others to address the threat posed by ISIS, who, those nations in the region, who share a common interest in bringing about the defeat of ISIS. You know, when you think about it, if, I, if, the, if ISIS's intention is to demolish the state system in that part of the world, all of the existing states in that part of the world who may differ on many other issues do share a common interest in preserving themselves. This is, this is, this is not a trivial diplomatic challenge that I'm describing. But what the United States needs to do is to persuade the governments of Saudi Arabia and Iran and Turkey and Egypt and, and even Iraq, if they could get their act together, to at least set aside for a moment all that they differ with one another about in order to, 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 to pool their efforts to bring about the defeat of ISIS. And I would state categorically that were they to do so, they possess more than ample power to solve the problem. They solve the problem rather than we solve the problem. Step three, and this gets to the, to the, to the larger, to, to, the, to the larger issues that royal that part of the world and end up manifesting themselves in terrorist activity. I'm not, I'm not an expert on the Islamic world. I'm not a, I'm not an expert on Islam. But as an observer, it seems to me that there is within Islam a very considerable ongoing crisis, the essence of which is the challenge posed by reconciling faith with modernity. We should empathize, those of us who are Christians, should empathize with that problem because Christians also had that difficulty and it led to very considerable bloodletting among groups, all of whose members came to believe that Jesus Christ was the savior and commanded us to love one another. This problem of reconciling faith with modernity as it exists in the Islamic world at the present moment is probably going to take some considerable time to play itself out. What can we do? Not a lot. It's, it's, it's foolish for us to think that somehow we can impose a resolution. But I think we could, by the way we live our lives, demonstrate that there is no contradiction between being a person of faith and also living within the modern world. And I believe that in concrete terms, th the contribution that we could make, it would not be decisive, it might be useful on the margins, is to encourage educational and cultural exchange between ourselves and, and the young people of 
uh, of countries in the greater Middle East. To, 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 to let them see that we do not represent what the violent radicals say that we represent. That's a three-part strategy. A number of questions coming in about refugees, Syrian refugees in Europe, and the proposal by the President to bring 10,000 of them into the U.S. Any comments about that and the danger that might pose to our democracies? Well, I, I, think, I think that the anti-refugee uh, sentiment that uh, has spiked in particular since the Paris attacks is uh, contemptible. Um, <laughs> frankly, <clears throat> the administration's uh, promise to admit 10,000 Syrians is pretty pathetic. Uh, I, I, I forget the number of total refugees that, that uh, created by the Syrian civil war, but it is in multiple millions, with the vast majority of them in what Turkey and uh, Lebanon. If I'm not mistaken, we even uh, in Jordan, we even have some Syrian refugees who have fled to Iraq, uh, which gives you some sense of how desperate. Uh, things are. So it seems to me that, that uh, first of all, we have a, a moral obligation to do better. Uh, but even beyond the moral obligation, it seems to me that, that here is an opportunity to demonstrate that there is no irreconcilable uh, conflict uh, between us and them as the jihadists. Uh, claim. Um, so yes, there are security concerns. Yes, there, sh there needs to be effective vetting. No, I am not able to articulate here in the next two minutes about what vetting procedures uh, should be applied, but it seems to me that uh, our national security bureaucracy, as vast as it is, ought to be able to figure out that sort of problem. Number of questions coming forward about a, a military draft or a draft for public service of young people in this in our country here. We have a number of students in the House who are asking this as well. Do you favor reinstatement? Well, I, I mean, I have I have uh, written on some number of occasions, and indeed, my this is really the topic of my book, uh, Breach of Trust, um, that there is something unseemly about the relationship between the American people and their military, uh, that the uh, professions of regard are uh, thin uh, to be kind about it. Uh, we all claim uh, to support the troops, uh, but that support uh, needs to go beyond uh, rhetoric. In my judgment, our, our foremost obligation with regard to the troops is to ensure that the troops are not subjected to abuse. And in the war for the greater Middle East that I have uh, described for you, they have been repeatedly subject to abuse. Uh, and as citizens, we should uh, rise up and insist that that must not happen. Why don't we rise up? Why, 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 why is the support, why does the support tend to be limited to rhetoric only? And the answer to that question, I think, does go back to the decision made by President Nixon toward the end of the Vietnam War to terminate the draft. Nixon did that, creating the so-called all-volunteer force, not because uh, President Nixon believed that the all-volunteer force was the in the interests of the Republic, but because he was trying to cut off the anti-war movement at the knees and buy himself more time to continue the Vietnam War on his terms. And indeed, that very cynical calculation on his part worked. Regardless, here we are all these years later 
with what the founders of our republic would, would call a standing army that exists at some remove from the rest of us as citizens. And I think it's past time for us to ask whether the all-volunteer force, which certainly does offer many uh, advantages in terms of the discipline and the capacity of U.S. troops, it's time for us to ask whether that system is appropriate for a democracy. And I think the answer is no, it's not. Well, <clears throat> What then is the solution? And the, and the question implies that the solution, I think it implies that, that the solution is the restoration of conscription. And one could make that argument, but I think the problem with that argument is that uh, uh, not only do uh, America's 18-year-olds uh, not favor conscription, but perhaps more significantly, the parents of Americans' 18-year-olds also don't favor conscription. So what can we do? The idea that's being pushed in some quarters, and it's an idea I support, is to enact a program of national service. <laughs> what is national service? National service is an idea that says that all young Americans owe to their country or to their community some period of service as they move toward full citizenship. And national service, and the menu of opportunities to serve would certainly include the opportunity to join the Marine Corps or join the Navy, but it would also include many other things as well. But national service would be, in essence, a universal obligation. And that arguably would be a way for us to reorient our military system in, in ways that would close the gap between the military and the people and, again, arguably, ensure that the next time some president wants to go and invade and occupy some far-off country, that the American people more generally will have skin in the game and therefore be somewhat more interested in what our president proposes to do. Thank you, Andrew Basevich. You've been listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Church in downtown Minneapolis. Thank you very much to our speaker, Andrew Basevich. Thank you.